Chapter 5 of The World That Couldn't Be by Clifford D. Cimac. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 He should go back, he knew it. Without the tracker he didn't have a chance. The odds were now with the Scytha, if indeed they had not been with it from the very start. Unkillable? Unkillable because it grew in intelligence to meet emergencies? Unkillable because, pressed, it could fashion a bow and arrow, however crude? Unkillable because it had a sense of tactics, like rolling rocks at night upon its enemy? Unkillable because a native tracker would cheerfully kill itself to protect the Scytha? A sort of crisis beast, perhaps, one able to develop intelligence and abilities to meet each new situation, and then lapsing back to the level of non-intelligent contentment? That, thought Duncan, would be a sensible way for anything to live. It could do away with the inconvenience and the irritability and the discontentment of intelligence when intelligence was unneeded. But the intelligence and the abilities which went with it would be there, safely tucked away, where no one could reach in and get them, like a necklace or a gun, something to be used or to be put away as the case might be. Duncan hunched forward, and with a stick of wood pushed the fire together. The flames blazed up anew and sent sparks flying up into the whispering darkness of the trees. The night had cooled off a little, but the humidity still hung on, and a man felt uncomfortable, a little frightened, too. Duncan lifted his head and stared up into the fire-flecked darkness. There were no stars, because the heavy foliage shut them out. He missed the stars. He felt better if he could look up and see them. When morning came, he should go back. He should quit this hunt which now had become impossible, and even slightly foolish. But he knew he wouldn't. Somewhere along the three-day trail he had become committed to a purpose and a challenge, and he knew that when morning came he would go on again. It was not hatred that drove him, nor vengeance, or even the trophy urge, the hunter-lust that prodded men to kill something strange or harder to kill or bigger than any man had ever killed before. It was something more than that, some weird entangling of the Scythe's meaning with his own. He reached out and picked up the rifle, and laid it in his lap. Its barrel gleamed dully in the flickering campfire light, and he rubbed his hand along the stock as other men might stroke a woman's throat. Mister, said a voice. It did not startle him, for the word was softly spoken, and for a moment he had forgotten that Sipar was dead, dead with a half-smile fixed upon its face, with its throat laid wide open. Mister, Duncan stiffened. Sipar was dead, and there was no one else, and yet someone had spoken to him and there could be only one thing in all this wilderness that might speak to him. Yes, he said. He did not move. He simply sat there with the rifle in his lap. You know who I am? I suppose you are the Scytha? You have done well, the Scytha said. You made a splendid hunt. There is no dishonor if you should decide to quit. Why don't you go back? I promise you no harm. It was over there, somewhere in front of him, somewhere in the brush beyond the fire, almost straight across the fire from him, Duncan told himself. If he could keep it talking, perhaps even lure it out. Why should I? he asked. The hunt is never done until one gets the thing one is after. I can kill you, the Scytha told him. But I do not want to kill. It hurts to kill. That's right, said Duncan. You are most perceptive. For he had it pegged now. 
He knew exactly where it was. He could afford a little mockery. His thumb slid up the metal and nudged the fire control to automatic, and he flexed his legs beneath him so that he could rise and fire in one single motion. "'Why do you hunt me?' the Scytha asked. "'You are a stranger on my world, and you had no right to hunt me. Not that I mind, of course. In fact, I found it stimulating. We must do it again. When I am ready to be hunted, I shall come and tell you, and we can spend a day or two at it. Sure we can, said Duncan, rising, and as he rose into his crouch, he held the trigger down, and the gun danced in insane fury, the muzzle flare a flickering tongue of hatred, and the hail of death hissing spitefully in the underbrush. Any time you want to, yelled Duncan gleefully, I'll come and hunt you. <laughs> you say the word and I'll be on your tail. I might even kill you. How do you like it, chump? And he held the trigger tight and kept his crouch, so the slugs would not fly high, but would cut their swath just above the ground, and he moved the muzzle back and forth a lot, so that he covered extra ground to compensate for any miscalculations he might have made. The magazine ran out, and the gun clicked empty, and the vicious chatter stopped. Powder smoke drifted softly in the campfire light, and the smell of it was perfume in the nostrils, and in the underbrush many little feet were running, as if a thousand frightened mice were scurrying from catastrophe. Duncan unhooked the extra magazine from where it hung upon his belt, and replaced the empty one. Then he snatched a burning length of wood from the fire, and waved it frantically until it burst into a blaze and became a torch. A rifle grasped in one hand, and the torch in the other, he plunged into the underbrush. Little chittering things fled to escape him. He did not find the Scytha. He found the chewed-up bushes and soil churned by flying metal, and he found five lumps of flesh and fur, and these he brought back to the fire. Now the fear that had been stalking him, keeping just beyond his reach, walked out from the shadows and hunkered by the campfire with him. He placed the rifle within easy reach and arranged the five bloody chunks on the ground close to the fire, and he tried, with trembling fingers, to restore them to the shape they'd been before the bullets struck them. And that was a good one, he thought with grim irony, because they had no shape. They had been part of the Scytha, and you killed a Scytha inch by inch, not with a single shot. You knocked a pound of meat off it the first time, and the next time you shot off another pound or two, and if you got enough shots at it, you finally carved it down to size, and maybe you could kill it then, although he wasn't sure. He was afraid. He admitted that he was, and he squatted there and watched his fingers shake, and he kept his jaws clamped tight to stop the chatter of his teeth. The fear had been getting closer all the time. He knew it had moved in by a step or two when Sipar cut its throat. And why in the name of God had the damn fool done it? It made no sense at all. He had wondered about Sipar's loyalties, and the very loyalties that he had dismissed as a sheer impossibility had been the answer after all. In the end, for some obscure reason, obscure to humans, that is, Sipar's loyalty had been to the Scytha. But then what was the use of searching for any reason in it? Nothing that had happened made any sense. It made no sense that a beast one was pursuing should up and talk to one, although it did fit in with the theory of the crisis beast he had fashioned in his mind. Progressive adaptation, he told himself. Carry adaptation far enough, and you'd reach communication. But... Might not the Scythus' power of adaptation be running down? 
Had the sight that gone about as far as it could force itself to go? Maybe so, he thought. It might be worth a gamble. Separ's suicide, for all its casualness, bore the overtones of a last-notch desperation, and the sight of speaking to Duncan, its attempt to parley with him, contained a note of weakness. The arrow had failed, and the rock-slide had failed, and so had Separ's death. What next would the sight that try? Had it anything to try? Tomorrow he'd find out. Tomorrow he'd go on. He couldn't turn back now. He was too deeply involved. He'd always wonder, if he turned back now, whether another hour or two might not have seen the end of it. There were too many questions, too much mystery. There was now far more at stake than ten rows of Vua. Another day might make some sense of it, might banish the dread walker that trod upon his heels, might bring some peace of mind. As it stood right at the moment, none of it made sense. But even as he thought it, suddenly one of the bits of bloody flesh and mangled fur made sense. Beneath the punching and prodding of his fingers it had assumed a shape. Breathlessly Duncan bent above it, not believing, not even wanting to believe, hoping frantically that it should prove completely wrong. But there was nothing wrong with it. The shape was there and could not be denied. It had somehow fitted back into its natural shape, and it was a baby screamer. Well, maybe not a baby, but at least a tiny screamer. Duncan sat back on his heels and sweated. He wiped his bloody hands upon the ground. He wondered what other shapes he'd find if he put back into proper place the other hunks of limpness that lay beside the fire. He tried and failed. They were too smashed and torn. He picked them up and tossed them in the fire. He took up his rifle and walked around the fire, sat down with his back against a tree, cradling the gun across his knees. Those little scurrying feet, he wondered, like the scampering of a thousand busy mice. He had heard them twice, that first night in the thicket by the waterhole, and again tonight. And what could the scythe be? Certainly not the simple, uncomplicated, marauding animal he had thought to start with. A hive-beast? A host animal? A thing masquerading in many different forms? Shotwell, trained in such deductions, might make a fairly accurate guess, but Shotwell was not here. He was at the farm fretting, more than likely, over Duncan's failure to return. Finally the first light of morning began to filter through the forest, and it was not the glaring clean white light of the open plain and bush, but a softened, diluted, fuzzy green light to match the smothering vegetation. The night noises died away, and the noises of the day took up. The sawings of unseen insects, the screechings of hidden birds, and something far away began to make a noise that sounded like an empty barrel falling slowly down a stairway. What little coolness the night had brought dissipated swiftly, and the heat clamped down, a breathless, relentless heat that quivered in the air. Circling, Duncan picked up the scythe trail not more than a hundred yards from the camp. The beast had been traveling fast. The pug marks were deeply sunk and widely spaced. Duncan followed as rapidly as he dared. It was a temptation to follow at a run to match the scythe's speed, for the trail was plain and fresh, and it fairly beckoned. And that was wrong, Duncan told himself. It was too fresh, too plain, almost as if the animal had gone to endless trouble so that the human could not miss the trail. He stopped his trailing and crouched beside a tree and studied the tracks ahead. His hands were too tense upon the gun, his body keyed too high and fine. He forced himself to take slow, deep breaths, 
He had to calm himself. He had to loosen up. He studied the tracks ahead. Four bunched pug marks, then a long leap interval, then four more bunched tracks, and between the sets of marks the forest floor was innocent and smooth. Too smooth, perhaps. Especially the third one from him. Too smooth and somehow artificial, as if someone had patted it with gentle hands to make it unsuspicious. Duncan sucked his breath in slowly. Trap? Or was his imagination playing tricks on him? And if it were a trap, he would have fallen into it if he had kept on following as he had started out. Now there was something else, a strange uneasiness, and he stirred uncomfortably, casting frantically for some clue to what it was. He rose and stepped out from the tree with the gun at ready. What a perfect place to set a trap, he thought. One would be looking at the pug marks, never at the space between them, for the space between would be neutral ground, safe to stride out upon. Oh, clever Scytha, he said to himself. Oh, clever, clever Scytha. And now he knew what the other trouble was, the great uneasiness. It was the sense of being watched. Somewhere up ahead, the Scytha was crouched, watching and waiting, anxious or exultant, maybe even with laughter rumbling in its throat. He walked slowly forward until he reached the third set of tracks, and he saw that he had been right. The little area ahead was smoother than it should be. Scytha, he called. His voice was far louder than he had meant it to be, and he stood astonished and a bit abashed. Then he realized why it was so loud. It was the only sound there was. The forest suddenly had fallen silent. The insects and birds were quiet, and the thing in the distance had quit falling down the stairs. Even the leaves were silent. There was no rustle in them, and they hung limp upon their stems. There was a feeling of doom, and the green light had changed to a copper light, and everything was still. And the light was copper. Duncan spun around in panic. There was no place for him to hide. Before he could take another step, the schoon came, and the winds rushed out of nowhere. The air was clogged with flying leaves and debris. Trees snapped and popped and tumbled in the air. The wind hurled Duncan to his knees, and as he fought to regain his feet, he remembered in a blinding flash of total recall how it had looked from atop the escarpment, the boiling fury of the winds and the mad swirling of the coppery mist, and how the trees had whipped in whirlpool fashion. He came, half erect and stumbled, clawing at the ground, in an attempt to get up again, whilst inside his brain an insistent clicking voice cried out for him to run, and somewhere another voice said to lie flat upon the ground, to dig in as best he could. Something struck him from behind, and he went down, pinned flat, with his rifle wedged beneath him. He cracked his head upon the ground, and the world whirled sickeningly, and plastered his face with a handful of mud and tattered leaves. He tried to crawl, and couldn't, for something had grabbed him by the ankle, and was hanging on. With a frantic hand he clawed the mess out of his eyes, spat it from his mouth. Across the spinning ground something black and angular tumbled rapidly. It was coming straight toward him, and he saw it was the Scytha, and that in another second it would be on top of him. He threw up an arm across his face with the elbow crooked to take the impact of the wind-blown Scytha and to ward it off. But it never reached him. Less than a yard away, the ground opened up to take the Scytha, and it was no longer there. Suddenly the wind cut off, and the leaves once more hung motionless, 
and the heat clamped down again, and that was the end of it. The schoon had come and struck and gone. Minutes, Duncan wondered, or perhaps no more than seconds. But in those seconds the forest had been flattened and the trees lay in shattered heaps. He raised himself on an elbow and looked to see what was the matter with his foot, and he saw that a fallen tree had trapped his foot beneath it. He tugged a few times experimentally. It was no use. Two close-set limbs, branching almost at right angles from the hole, had been driven deep into the ground, and his foot, he saw, had been caught at the ankle in the fork of the buried branches. The foot didn't hurt, not yet. It didn't seem to be there at all. He tried wiggling his toes, and felt none. He wiped the sweat off his face with the shirt-sleeve and fought to force down the panic that was rising in him. Getting panicky was the worst thing a man could do in a spot like this. The thing to do was to take stock of the situation, figure out the best approach, then go ahead and try it. The tree looked heavy, but perhaps he could handle it if he had to, although there was danger that if he shifted it, the bowl might settle more solidly and crush his foot beneath it. At the moment, the two heavy branches thrust into the ground on either side of his ankle were holding most of the tree's weight off his foot. The best thing to do, he decided, was to dig the ground away beneath his foot until he could pull it out. He twisted around and started digging with the fingers of one hand. Beneath the thin covering of humus, he struck a solid surface, and his fingers slid along it. With mounting alarm, he explored the ground, scratching at the humus. There was nothing but rock, some long-buried boulder, the top of which lay just beneath the ground. His foot was trapped beneath a heavy tree and a massive boulder, held securely in place by forked branches that had forced their splintering way down along the boulder's sides. He lay back, propped on an elbow. It was evident that he could do nothing about the buried boulder. If he was going to do anything, his problem was the tree. To move the tree he would need a lever, and he had a good stout lever in his rifle. It would be a shame, he thought a little wryly, to use a gun for such a purpose, but he had no choice. He worked for an hour, and it was no good. Even with the rifle as a pry, he could not budge the tree. He lay back, defeated, breathing hard, wringing wet with perspiration. He grimaced at the sky. All right, Scythe, he thought. You won out in the end, but it took a schoon to do it. With all your tricks, you couldn't do the job until— Then he remembered. He sat up hurriedly. Scytha! he called. The Scytha had fallen into a hole that had opened in the ground. The hole was less than an arm's length away from him, with a little debris around its edges still trickling into it. Duncan stretched out his body, lying flat upon the ground, and looked into the hole. There, at the bottom of it, was the Scytha. It was the first time he'd gotten a good look at the Scytha, and it was a crazily put-together thing. It seemed to have nothing functional about it, and it looked more like a heap of something just thrown on the ground than it did an animal. The hole he saw was more than an ordinary hole. It was a pit, and very cleverly constructed. The mouth was about four feet in diameter, and it widened to roughly twice that at the bottom. It was, in general, bottle-shaped, with an in-curving shoulder at the top, so that anything that fell in could not climb out. Anything falling into that pit was in to stay. This, Duncan knew, was what had laid beneath that too smooth interval between the two sets of scythe tracks. The Scytha had worked all night to dig it, then had carried away the dirt dug out of the pit, and had built a flimsy camouflage cover over it. Then 
it had gone back and made the trail that was so loud and clear, so easy to make out and follow, and having done all that, having labored hard and stealthily, the Scytha had settled down to watch, to make sure the following human had fallen in the pit. "'Hi, pal,' said Duncan. "'How are you making out?' The Scytha did not answer. "'Classy pit,' said Duncan. "'Do you always din up in luxury like this?' But the Scytha didn't answer. Something queer was happening to the Scytha. It was coming all apart. Duncan watched with fascinated horror as the Scytha broke down into a thousand lumps of motion that scurried in the pit and tried to scramble up its sides, only to fall back in tiny showers of sand. Amid the scurrying lumps, one thing remained intact, a fragile object that resembled nothing quite so much as the stripped skeleton of a Thanksgiving turkey. But it was a most extraordinary Thanksgiving skeleton, for it throbbed with pulsing life and glowed with a steady violet light. Chitterings and squeakings came out of the pit, and the soft patter of tiny running feet, and as Duncan's eyes became accustomed to the darkness of the pit, he began to make out the forms of some of the scurrying shapes. There were tiny screamers, and some Donovans, and sawmill birds, and a bevy of kill devils, and something else as well. Duncan raised his hand and pressed it against his eyes, then took it quickly away. The little faces still were there, looking up as if beseeching him, with the white shine of their teeth and the white rolling of their eyes. He felt horror wrenching at his stomach and the sour, bitter taste of revulsion welled into his throat, but he fought it down, harking back to that day at the farm before they had started on the hunt. "'I can track down anything but screamers, stilt-birds, longhorns, and donovans,' Sipor had told him solemnly. "'Those are my taboos.' And Sipor was also their taboo, for he had not feared the donovan. Sipar had been, however, somewhat fearful of the screamers in the dead of night, because, the native had told him reasonably, screamers were forgetful. Forgetful of what? Forgetful of the Scytha mother? Forgetful of the motley brood in which they had spent their childhood? For that was the only answer to what was running in the pit and the whole unsuspected answer to the enigma against which men like Shotwell had frustratedly banged their heads for years. Strange, he told himself. All right, it might be strange, but if it worked, what difference did it make? So the planet's denizens were sexless, because there was no need of sex? What was wrong with that? It might, in fact, Duncan admitted to himself, head off a lot of trouble, no family spats, no triangle trouble, no fighting over mates. While it might be unexciting, it did seem downright peaceful. And since there was no sex, the Scytha species was the planetary mother, but more than just a mother. The Scytha, more than likely, was mother, father, incubator, nursery, teacher, and perhaps many other things besides, all rolled into one. In many ways, he thought, it might make a lot of sense. Here, natural selection would be ruled out, and ecology could be controlled in considerable degree, and mutation might even be a matter of deliberate choice rather than random happenstance and it would make for a potential planetary unity such as no other world had ever known. Everything here was kin to everything else. Here was a planet where man or any other alien must learn to tread most softly, for it was not inconceivable that in a crisis or a clash of interests one might find himself face suddenly with a unified and cooperating planet 
with every form of life making common cause against the interloper. The little scurrying things had given up. They'd gone back to their places, clustered around the pulsing violet of the Thanksgiving skeleton, each one fitting into place until the scytha had taken shape again. As if, Duncan told himself, blood and nerve and muscle had come back from a brief vacation to form the beast anew. Mister, asked the scyther, what do we do now? You should know, Duncan told it. You were the one who dug the pit. I split myself, the scyther said. A part of me dug the pit, and the other part that stayed on the surface got me out when the job was done. Convenient, grunted Duncan. And it was convenient. That was what had happened to the scytha when he had shot it. It had split into all its component parts and had got away. And that night beside the water-hole it had spied on him, again in the form of all its separate parts from the safety of the thicket. "'You are caught, and so am I,' the scytha said. "'Both of us will die here. It seems a fitting end to our association. Do you not agree with me?' "'I'll get you out,' said Duncan wearily. "'I have no quarrel with children.' He dragged the rifle toward him and unhooked the sling from the stock. Carefully he lowered the gun by the sling, still attached to the barrel down into the pit. The scythia reared up and grasped it with its forepaws. "'Easy now,' Duncan cautioned. "'You're heavy. I don't know if I can hold you.' But he needn't have worried. The little ones were detaching themselves and scrambling up the rifle in the sling. They reached his extended arms and ran up them with scrabbling claws. Little sneering screamers and the comic stilt birds and the mouse-sized kill devils that snarled at him as they climbed. And the little grinning natives. Not babies, scarcely children, but small additions of full-grown humanoids. And the weird Donovan scampering happily. They came, climbing up his arms and across his shoulders, and milled about on the ground beside him, waiting for the others. And, finally, the scytha, not skinned down to the bare bones of its Thanksgiving turkey size, but far smaller than it had been, climbed awkwardly up the rifle and the sling to safety. Duncan hauled the rifle up and twisted himself into a sitting position. The scytha, he saw, was reassembling. He watched in fascination as the restless miniatures of the planet's life swarmed and seethed like a hive of bees, each one clicking into place to form the entire beast. And now the scytha was complete, yet small, still small, no more than lion size. But it is such a little one, Sakara had argued with him that morning at the farm, it is such a young one. Such a young brood, no more than suckling infants, if suckling was the word, or even some kind of wild approximation. And through the months and years the scytha would grow with the growing of its diverse children until it became a monstrous thing. It stood there looking at Duncan and the tree. Now, said Duncan, if you'll push on the tree, I think that between the two of us— it is too bad, the scytha said, and wheeled itself about. He watched it go, loping off. Hey! he yelled, but it didn't stop. He grabbed up the rifle and had it halfway to his shoulder before he remembered how absolutely futile it was to shoot at the scytha. He let the rifle down. The dirty, ungrateful, double-crossing— He stopped himself. There was no profit in rage. When you were in a jam, you did the best you could. You figured out the problem, and you picked the course that seemed best, and you didn't panic at the odds. He laid the rifle in his lap, and started to hook up the sling, and it was not till then that he saw the barrel was packed with sand and dirt. He sat numbly for a moment, 
thinking back to how close he had been to firing at the Scytha. And if that barrel was packed hard enough or deep enough, he might have had an exploding weapon in his hands. He had used the rifle as a crowbar, which was no way to use a gun. That was one way, he told himself, that was guaranteed to ruin it. Duncan hunted around and found a twig and dug at the clogged muzzle, but the dirt was jammed too firmly in it, and he made little progress. He dropped the twig and was hunting for another stronger one when he caught the motion in a nearby clump of brush. He watched closely for a moment, and there was nothing, so he resumed the hunt for a stronger twig. He found one and started poking at the muzzle, and there was another flash of motion. He twisted around. Not more than twenty feet away, a screamer sat easily on its haunches. Its tongue was lolling out, and it had what looked like a grin upon its face. And there was another, just at the edge of the clump of brush where he had caught the motion first. There were others as well, he knew. He could hear them sliding through the tangle of fallen trees, could sense the soft padding of their feet. The executioners, he thought. The Scytha certainly had not wasted any time. He raised the rifle and wrapped the barrel smartly on the fallen tree, trying to dislodge the obstruction in the bore, but it didn't budge. The barrel still was packed with sand. But no matter. He'd have to fire anyhow and take whatever chance there was. He shoved the control to automatic, and tilted up the muzzle. There were six of them now, sitting in a ragged row, grinning at him, not in any hurry. They were sure of him, and there was no hurry. He'd still be there when they decided to move in. And there were others, on all sides of him. Once it started, he wouldn't have a chance. "'It'll be expensive, gents,' he told them. And he was astonished at how calm, how coldly objective he could be now that the chips were down. But that was the way it was, he realized. He thought, a while ago, how a man might suddenly find himself face to face with an aroused and cooperating planet. Maybe this was it in miniature. The Scytha had obviously passed the word along. Man back there needs killing. Go and get him. Just like that, for a Scytha would be the power here, a life force, the giver of life, the decider of life, the repository of all animal life on the entire planet. There was more than one of them, of course. Probably they had home districts, spheres of influence and responsibility mapped out. And each one would be a power supreme in its own district. Momism, he thought with a sour grin, Momism at its absolute peak. Nevertheless, he told himself, it wasn't too bad a system if you wanted to consider it objectively. But he was in a poor position to be objective about that or anything else. The screamers were inching closer, hitching themselves forward slowly on their bottoms. I'm going to set up a deadline for you critters, Duncan called out. Just two feet farther, up to that rock, and I let you have it. He'd get all six of them, of course, but the shots would be the signal for the general rush by all those other animals slinking in the brush. If he were free, if he were on his feet, possibly he could beat them off, but pinned as he was, he didn't have a chance. It would be all over less than a minute after he opened fire. He might, he figured, last as long as that. The six inched closer, and he raised the rifle. But they stopped and moved no farther. Their ears lifted just a little as if they might be listening, and the grins dropped from their faces. They squirmed uneasily and assumed a look of guilt, and, like shadows, they were gone, melting away so swiftly that he scarcely saw them go. Duncan sat quietly, listening, but he could hear no sound. Reprieve, he thought, but for how long? Something had scared them off, but in a while they might be back. 
He had to get out of here, and he had to make it fast. If he could find a longer lever, he could move the tree. There was a branch slanting up from the top side of the fallen tree. It was almost four inches at the butt, and it carried its diameter well. He slid the knife from his belt and looked at it. Too small, too thin, he thought, to chisel through a four-inch branch, but it was all he had. When a man was desperate enough, though, when his very life depended on it, he would do anything. He hitched himself along, sliding toward the point where the branch protruded from the tree. His pinned leg protested with stabs of pain as his body wrenched it around. He gritted his teeth and pushed himself closer. Pain slashed through his leg again, and he was still long inches from the branch. He tried once more, then gave up. He lay panting on the ground. There was just one thing left. He'd have to try to hack out a notch in the trunk just above his leg. No, that would be next to impossible, for he'd be cutting into the ward and twisted grain at the base of the supporting fork. Either that or cut off his foot, and that was even more impossible. A man would faint before he got the job done. It was useless. He knew he could do neither one. There was nothing he could do. For the first time he admitted to himself he would stay here and die. Shotwell, back at the farm in a day or two, might set out hunting for him, but Shotwell would never find him, and anyhow by nightfall, if not sooner, the screamers would be back. He laughed gruffly in his throat, laughing at himself. The Scytha had won the hunt hands down. It had used a human weakness to win, and then had used that same human weakness to achieve a viciously poetic vengeance. After all, what could one expect? One could not equate human ethics with the ethics of the Scytha. Might not human ethics in certain cases seem as weird and illogical as infamous and ungrateful to an alien? He hunted for a twig and began working again to clean the rifle bore. A crashing behind him twisted him around, and he saw the Scytha. Behind the Scytha stalked a Donovan. He tossed away the twig and raised the gun. No, said the Scytha sharply. The Donovan tramped purposefully forward, and Duncan felt the prickling of the skin across his back. It was a frightful thing. Nothing could stand before a Donovan. The screamers had turned tail and run when they had heard it a couple of miles or more away. The Donovan was named for the first known human to be killed by one. That first was only one of many. The roll of Donovan victims ran long, and no wonder, Duncan thought. It was the closest he had ever been to one of the beasts, and he felt a coldness creeping over him. It was like an elephant and a tiger and a grizzly bear, wrapped in the self-same hide. It was the most vicious fighting machine that had ever been spawned. He lowered the rifle. There would be no point in shooting. In two quick strides the beast could be upon him. The Donovan almost stepped on him, and he flinched away. Then the great head lowered, and gave the fallen tree a butt, and the tree bounced for a yard or two. The Donovan kept on walking. Its powerfully muscled stern moved into the brush and out of sight. "'Now we are even,' said the Scytha. "'I had to get some help.' Donovan grunted. He flexed the leg that had been trapped, and he could not feel the foot. Using his rifle as a cane, he pulled himself erect. He tried putting weight on the injured foot, and it screamed with pain. He braced himself with the rifle and rotated so that he faced the Scytha. "'Thanks, pal,' he said. "'I didn't think you'd do it.' "'You will not hunt me now?' Duncan shook his head. <laughs> "'I'm in no shape for hunting. I am heading home.' "'It was the Vua, wasn't it? That was why you hunted me?' "'The Vua is my livelihood,' said Duncan. "'I cannot let you eat it.' The Scytha stood silently, and Duncan watched it for a moment. Then he wheeled. 
Using the rifle for a crutch, he started hobbling away. The Scytha hurried to catch up with him. Let us make a bargain, mister. I will not eat the vua, and you will not hunt me. Is that fair enough? That is fine with me, said Duncan. Let us shake on it. He put down a hand, and the Scytha lifted up a paw. They shook somewhat awkwardly, but very solemnly. Now, the Scytha said, I will see you home. The screamers would have you before you got out of the woods. End of chapter 5